our generation in general is pretty hung up on labels, you know, everything from music to sexuality to whatever, you know, it's like things are, have to be classified and there's, you know, there's kind of an obsession over putting things in buckets. Whereas I think Gen Z is, is a lot more about fluidity and sort of like, you know, questioning why we need these labels at all to begin with, or at least like maybe we should just loosen up a little bit about them, which I think makes a ton of sense, you know? All right, we're back with uh, another episode, and I'm joined by my guy who is also probably limited sleep, fresh off of paternity leave himself. Zach, how are you holding up these days, man? Not too bad. I think we got eight hours last night out of uh, Riley, little Riley. So life is uh, life is definitely getting a little bit more normal, uh, but it's it's all good. <laughs> sleep or no sleep, it's it's just a blast. Uh, love to hear it. I'll hopefully be at that eight hour stretch soon. I'm a couple weeks behind you at the new boards, but we'll save some time at the end to catch up on girl dad life. But All let's, right. let's start things at the top though. We got a, some big topics you want to dive into, but this first one that caught my eye, and it sounds like it caught your eye too. This quote from Irv Gotti, who just did this huge deal. Of course, Irv Gotti, CEO, one of the founders of Murder, Inc., he was able to do a $300 million deal recently with Iconoclast, where he was able to sell his share, his 50% share of Murder, Inc.'s masters for $100 million. And plus, he also got a $200 million line of credit that's going to be specifically used for future TV and film projects that are likely going to be based off of some of the murder and IP or other things. But in an interview that he did talking about this deal with Billboard, he said this quote, and I've been thinking a lot about it. He said, entertainment industry is music, TV, and film, right? The music business is the lowest form, and I just bagged $100 million for some shit I did 20 years ago. And the interviewer then follows up and is like, you know, can you say more? And he says, it's just the facts. More money is made in TV and with movies than music. It's a non-disputable fact. We love the music industry. I love the music industry. There's money to be made, but it's dwarfed by the money made from TV and film. If I have 100 episodes of television and I own it, they'll probably put a uh, worth on it that's 300 or 400 million with 300 or 400 million i could sell it at a 10 to 20 x multiple that's three to six billion dollars this is why tyler perry is a billionaire that's why i sold my masters and i did this deal with iconoclast so i pause and although i get what he's saying and i think there is some interesting discussion there i think there's a lot of nuance there and I'm not quite sure if I'm completely on board with him on this. That said, I think Herb Gotti is great. I always loved what Murdering did. But I think that this particular statement has a bit more nuance, especially with what we've seen happening in music the past few years. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I, you know, and I think he got into some fuzzy math there at the end. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, to, 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 multi, you know, to multiply what by 10? And we're talking how many billion dollars? Like, uh, what did Disney pay three, three or four billion dollars for the entire Star Wars <laughs> library? So uh, I know that was a, a great deal for them and it's worth a lot more now. But um, I think I think the math might be a, a little bit off. But I would kind of flip it and say, you know, <clears throat> sure. Um, you know, there are movies that gross, uh, that gross billions of dollars or, you know, hundreds of millions or, or in, into the billions, low billions. Um, but like it, it, there aren't albums that do that. Uh, okay. But, you know, in terms of libraries, I mean, we just saw Bruce Springsteen get half a billion dollars for his, I mean, we're seeing these, you know, masters and uh, publishing go for hundreds of millions of dollars. The fact that Irv Gotti got $100 million for half of the murdering catalog, I mean, that's a wild number. No, no Not to um, sort of sleep on the murdering catalog, but, you know, it's not, it's not Bruce Springsteen. Um, so, you know, I think that actually the fact that he was able to get $100 million shows 
that um, the music industry is is actually alive and well, right? Um, in in terms of the valuations, so yeah, I'm not I'm not sure how much I I, I agree with that, um, especially when you look at you know, like for example, I was in the movie when I was a kid. Uh, the movie's called Lorenzo's Oil, and I played Lorenzo. It was a, a big role, and I still get checks for sixty bucks, <laughs> you know, uh, every, every few months, and that's nice. Um, and I'm sure that Nick Nolte and Susan Sarandon, who were in it, get much bigger checks. But you know, they can't really go and like sell that catalog. You know, you don't have masters as an actor. Uh, I suppose you could go and sell the royalty streams or companies that let you do that now, but it's not the same in terms of intellectual property. You don't, um, there's not like a equivalent to, you know, songwriting, um, you know, like the sort of the same kind of IP that, you know, at least if you are an actor, uh, or an artist or, you know, you would have access into your, to your masters in a way that you wouldn't as an actor, unless maybe you're Tom Cruise and you negotiate some crazy back end deal. So, um, I think that the grass is a little bit greener on, on the music side than uh, the nerve is, is giving it credit for. Yeah, I think the difference is that you're highlighting it is that it's not so much the top line number. It's more so just how the business model under that number is distributed between who owns the underlying content and who doesn't. And I think if you're Irv and you're trying to compare this from this perspective of if you're in music and you're trying to do a deal with. Universal, whether you're an artist or you were an indie label at the time trying to do a distribution deal or some type of um, joint venture. I forget exactly what uh, Murder Inc's, what Murder Inc had at the time, but comparing that isn't the same to comparing what Tyler Perry is doing because even what Tyler Perry's doing, he is a very much a unicorn in that right. There's not that many actors that are owning the underlying. IP of the work that they're doing. Tyler Perry is the writer, the director, the producer for all of these things. That's why he is getting those things. And that is a very unique use case because in most cases, those are all different people in television. And I think, to be honest, TV is likely getting even murkier now because so much of the money that was going into these projects was based on this concept that these video streaming services could just have infinite growth and just keep growing and growing. And now we're kind of reaching this point where people are like, okay, Netflix had 220 million people paying 10, 15, almost $20 a month. Maybe that was as high as it could potentially go. I mean, I think there's plenty to break down there, but if those dollars aren't going to be as high as they may have been in that perspective, then we're going to see the shift. I did look at some top line numbers, which are, I think, a good way to kind of balance things out. The music industry almost made $30 billion last year. I think it was around $28 billion last year for recorded music overall. So that does not include concerts or any of those things. I know that Herb isn't referring to that. But then if you look at the box office, I mean, that's more money than the global box office made. Granted, last year was a pandemic year, so I know it's a bit tough to compare these things. And there's a lot more other things there, but it's not so much that this industry itself doesn't make as much money. Cause yeah, you mentioned Bruce just got half a billion for all of his stuff. He owns this stuff. And you know that, you know, born in the USA is going to be played at f- for, for, for decades at least with, you know, as long as your baby boomers and Gen X and I guess even millennials that are big Springsteen fans continue to listen. But I think that's different than how, Irv might be looking at it. The thing is, though, it's not just Irv, I think, that has this perspective. I think a lot of other folks have that perspective, too. But I think it stems from when you are at the lowest rung of being the talent in the particular industry. I think music at that stage is likely a bit less advantageous than it may be for you know, an actor per se. And maybe that's a bit of the difference where if you're a music, that's just signing. If you're a musician, that's just signing on for a deal. It's going to take a lot longer for you to maybe recoup though that money than an actor would, you know, signing on for an equivalent level size of something. But that's definitely very different than putting that as a global claim about the broader industry. That's true. But I I would still argue that if you are, an artist getting into the game as a, as a musician, uh, the default would be that you would probably have shared ownership 
of your masters. If you are an actor getting into the acting game, the default is like you get an okay chunk of money uh, for one movie. <laughs> you know, there's no like that. You, you, it doesn't come with IP in the way that it would. And so it's not until later in your career that you can start to say, Hey, I, I want to be a director. I want to be a producer um, until you start to get, or, you know, or maybe you're kind of DIY from the beginning and, and you're doing it all of it yourself, but that's, that's so unusual. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think the other thing too, is that like, and maybe this is part of what Irv was alluding to. I mean, that hundred million dollars that he got uh, that to me seemed like a number that was more, along the lines of the stuff we were seeing, you know, six months to a year ago um, before interest rates doubled and we kind of stopped hearing about these big deals. So I wonder if that deal, and I kind of asked around a little bit and I couldn't get a, a, a firm answer, but I would suspect that that deal, you know, was agreed upon, you know, like last fall or something before the economic environment changed. And, you know, and it just didn't close until now because these, these deals can take six months to a year to close. And, and that's why, you know, you got such a good multiple. But like these days, you know, when the interest rate is like gone from 3% to 6% um, or whatever, because it depends on the kind of deals you're doing. But, you know, that's a huge difference. And it sort of like makes buying music assets a lot less interesting because, you know, it, it's it's no longer like when just like normal financial instruments, you know, and not to get like too nerdy about it, but, you know, in the bond market are generating something closer to what a music catalog would, would do. I think, I think like these big financial institutions are going to be more inclined to, to kind of like lean on their expertise rather than trying to to do these exotic things or, you know, get involved with, with music catalogs and, and intellectual property and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I could see that. I think the other piece of this too, that may get lost in some of the details, especially is that this isn't a publishing catalog deal. This is, masters at least partial ownership there or not partial ownership but at least the revenue generating from at least half of what urban had and at least in streaming your recorded revenue from the master side is at least three to four times higher than what the publishers are getting of course there have been some there's some recent changes where the publisher royalty is increased i think increased from 10 and a half percent to 15.1 percent recently so that'll help but still that piece of it does in many ways so even if let's say you were to compare this number for the uh murdering masters to let's say what justin timberlake got for his catalog deal you can't necessarily compare that because timberlake's was for the piece of the music sound recordings that was less valuable, relatively speaking, at least currently than this. So I do think sometimes like those things do get lost in it, but it would be interesting to see yeah, what would that be like now if those deals were starting to try to close or if those conversations were happening. I think it, I think it would be interesting and also a bit unique because this deal is with iconoclast this isn't one of the standard players that we've seen that are handing out you know the the nine figure checks to these companies who knows what the conversations could have been like with hypnosis or uh mm -hmm. round hill or some of the others i feel like right. he may have alluded to that to some extent in the interview but it was hard to get a sense specifically yeah and you also wonder i mean uh, how much of it was about you know, being able to say, oh, now we have a catalog that like there is some Jay-Z in there. There's some DMX in there. I think there's some J-Lo in there, um, you know, in addition to like a lot of Ja Rule and Ashanti <laughs> and, and uh, you know, but that's that's kind of a big, um, you know, that that's kind of like a trophy to have that, you know, I, I don't know that it's quite so often that, you know, anything by Jay-Z comes up. I think it was there's a piece of Can I Live on there, uh, which which is pretty cool. So. Nice. You know, th that, that might have added you know, a sort of certain premium to it. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. What do you think is the crowding jewel of this catalog? I mean, every one of these catalog sales, it has the typical 80-20 or the power law thing where there is a few big songs that are really generating everything. I mean, you mentioned J-Lo. I mean, I'm Real has to be one of the biggest murdering songs they had or maybe always yeah. on time with – you know, Ja Rule and Ashanti. I feel like, are, are there any yeah. others that stick out? 
I mean, the Jay Z one for sure. Uh, which DMX song was it? It was it was a pretty big one. Um, I think it's uh, what's my name? Was it? Uh, yeah. What's my oh, name? what's my DMX? name? Oh, that that was on X's was on catalog. That was that was that was Rough Riders and Def Jam. Oh, that, that was one. okay. But um, Jay Z, they, they were on. It's Murder though, right? It's Murder from um, Ja Rule's Vinny Vinny Vici. That had Jay and DMX. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Is that what was it? There was some. It was like somewhere in the discography. I was looking at it though. Um, ah well, uh, I'll I'll uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll yeah. track it down someday. We'll have to talk about it the next time, but. There was there was a big DMX single that somehow ended up on there um, that that's that caught my eye. Um, but you know, like a lot of the Ja Rule stuff, I think uh, I think maybe Living It Up was on there. Oh yeah, that uh, was big. That's a yep. huge one. Yeah, like Down so, for You, like Down Ass Bitch, like you had a few of those that were. It, it had Shanti yeah. had some big ones too, like Foolish. Foolish was huge. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Here. Okay. It says, what's my name? It said that he produced what's my name. So that's why, even though it wasn't a. Oh, a interesting. Ring. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's love. That's a huge one. Oh, that's a big one. Yep. The fat right? show in the Shanti. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Can I live? Hala hala. You know, so there's, there's some really good stuff on there. Um, and I think you're right. It's probably, there's a couple, you know, without us having a, a look at the, at the statements, it's hard to know, but. It, it wouldn't surprise me if one of those songs is just like, like, you know, what, what's up? Like, that could be, I don't know. Like that could just be like a, like a sleeper hit that just continues to, I mean, we know it's a big hit, but it, it could be like way more lucrative than we ever imagined. Or one of those could have been in a movie, uh, you know, more, more than the others or something like that. So, you know, I think a lot of these songs are, are going to be, actually, that's what one of the lawyers I reached out to about this said, he was like, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there um, that is very interesting from uh, from the sync perspective. You know, to the to the sort of like millennial, exennial crowd that grew up on that um, that would love to see it in movies and TV and video games. So, you know, that could be part of it too. Big on sync, also big on likelihood of being turned into some viral TikTok trend. I don't know <laughs> if that is a quantifiable metric they're using, but I would, I think it is. I just think of so many of the TikTok things that blow up and that era of early 2000s, late 90s hip hop has done really well in a lot of ways. And sometimes it's so random, but I do think that that murdering sound captures so much of that. It's only before long that someone finds some like weird thing that happened in one of the music videos and then that then becomes viral and then it becomes like a whole tiktok viral campaign yep yep although don't know how, how much they'll be getting paid from tiktok but that's a whole other <laughs> that's a whole other story <laughs> we'll have to save that one for next for the next chat we got to see how see how that whole situation firms up but so the next topic that we want to talk about is a fascinating piece that was a guest post that was written by someone that you had worked with, Tiffany, and she had wrote a really interesting essay on why mood is the new musical genre. And when you picked me on this, I was like, go read it. I, I read it and it stuck out because I was like, you know what? It's 100% right. If you look at Spotify and you look at how all these streaming services have shifted how music is being consumed and listened to, yeah, it isn't rock, pop, country, hip hop. It's lo-fi chill vibes it's you know backyard barbecue hang it's all of these super niche things that reflect a lot more of where music listening is going and i could only imagine there's so many broader implications that it can have but i'd love to hear what you think about it yeah absolutely so i've been out on paternity leave and and you know not really writing but um uh tiffany who, who's a really great writer and and was doing some research for me while she was a senior at, at my alma mater um, at Yale. And, and she and I were actually, we worked on the same basically arts and culture desk on the school newspaper, you know, whatever it was, 15 years apart. Um, so she, while I was out, she wrote this great long piece kind of talking about how, you know, from her generation's perspective, this idea that, yeah, that you would classify things by genre or really identify yourself as like a hip hop fan or a rock fan or whatever is all kind of moot. It's like an old people thing. And that her generation is more about moods and, and like you say, it's backyard barbecue or whatever it is. And, and people don't, you know, really care about 
genre so much anymore, uh, you know, amongst the sort of Gen Z crowd. And, and, and she, you know, really kind of dug into some, I think, great examples of it and talked about Spotify classifications and how they put together their audio auras that give you your kind of like year end picture of, of your listening tastes. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a really great point. And, and I think that, you know, our generation in general is pretty hung up on labels, you know, everything from music to sexuality to whatever, you know, it's, it's always, it's like things are, have to be classified and there's, you know, there's kind of an obsession over putting things in buckets. Whereas I think Gen Z is, is a lot more about fluidity and sort of like, you know, questioning why, why we need these labels at all um, to begin with, or at least like maybe we should just loosen up a little bit about them, which I think makes a ton of sense. You know, I mean, I remember when Halsey put out that song, New Americana, and she talked about being raised on Biggie and Nirvana. And I was like, yeah, that's me. I like, I, I, I get that. Um, and, but there's, but that always felt weird when people were like, well, what kind of music are you into? And I was like hip hop and grunge rock and like some other stuff. And, you know, that was always sort of weird, but I think it's good to see uh, the, the next generation kind of embrace that more. And that's what the article kind of dug into. The label and generation identification is a huge thing. Do you remember growing up when the labels of how we were and folks were in middle school and high school was such a thing that people went down the road? It was like, oh, you're a skater. Oh, then you listen to Linkin Park. Then you listen to this and you dress and you wear like Jinko jeans, like with the, the chain hanging from the back of your pocket to the front or whatever. You're a prep. Okay. You shop at Abercrombie and Fitch. You're probably wearing the Adidas superstars and you probably, I don't know, wear clothes from like structure or like <laughs> express and stuff <laughs> like that. Like there were all these buckets too. And then it extended as well. If you listen to hip hop, you probably wore Timbaland's. You probably had Nike Air Force Ones. You probably wore a Nietzsche or Echo or whatever the popular clothes were at the time. It's like all of these things. And this generation and time frame is just like, no, that's not the case. And I think this mood thing factors in a lot of that. I think we're almost seeing this to some extent with things we've kind of just seen with like regionality as well. Like I've heard a lot of people talk about how from, you know, certain generations, it's like, oh, like, well, people in Seattle, they dress like this. Like you could go to Seattle, walk or like, you know, the Pacific Northwest and everyone's wearing flannel, like it's a Nirvana music video or whatever. Or if you go down south, like I would visit my cousins in Florida growing up and they would be listening to Yin Yang Twins and, you know, B.I.B.I. B. and all these other songs that you were popular at the time. And we just weren't listening to that stuff nearly as much mm -hmm. growing up in the Northeast. And it hit that vibe. And I think now, too, because of the Internet, so much of that generationality piece is just – or not the generationality, the ge geographical identity is also dissipated, too, where – people in Seattle can, you know, feel no different, especially from a youth perspective, could feel no different than someone growing up in Miami or Fort Lauderdale or whatever it is. So I'm curious to see how is that going to shape even the legacy labels that we do have on things. I think that the Grammys is, you know, clearly an institution that has prided itself on the number of options that it's given particular artists to have and celebrate their particular genres of music based on these legacy labels. I think it takes a lot of time for those things to change, but will we see that? Could you eventually see things where I think pop radio in a lot of ways and radio in general is still one of the things that's still holding on to this generational, you know, label divides much to a fault because I think there's still certain types of artists that are precluded from being heard on Z100 or being heard on your mainstream stations. So I think that it may still take time to get there, but I'm curious to see what that look like 20 years, 20 years from now. Will we still see the same restrictions in radio and in award ceremonies? So I think those are the two areas that feel harder to disrupt than the broader culture that already has been disrupted by it. Yeah. And, and one of the other things that um, Tiffany wrote about in this article, uh, which you, oh, you can read it, uh, just it's zogblog.com and you can go through the newsletter. It's the latest post. I'll be back writing uh, in, in, a, in a week or two, I think. But, um, but anyway, it's up there on zogblog.com. And, and she said, uh, she pointed out that Igor won for best rap album 
even though it's not really a rap album. Um, like it's already happening, right? Like in categories at the Grammys. Um, so right. Like how, how soon until, you know, we, we start to, we start to change that or, or even have sort of like broader, you know, kinds of label. Like what if the, what if it's like, you know, best chill album, <laughs> you know, best barbecue album. I don't know. Uh, so I'd love to see how that, how that kind of turns out. But man, I remember, you know, it, in the nineties when, when you would sort of put on your AOL profile, what kind of music you listen to, a lot of people sort of also define themselves in opposition to certain genres. They're like, I listen to anything but country and rap, you know, that I remember a lot of people say anything but rap, anything but country. That was sort of their, their, um, their battle cry. And, um, you know, I just don't see too much of that anymore. And, and I think that's a great thing, you know, like there's, it's like, why should you have to limit your taste? It's like, you know, you don't want to be a, a traitor to, to your emo, whatever, by, by listening to, um, hip hop, but, but now we have like emo hip hop. It's great. It's, uh, you know, you see what you will about emo hip hop, but I think it's, I think it's cool that we have, you know, all these kind of like mixings and, and subgenres and so forth. So. Yeah. If anything, I think I'll see the angst more for particular artists themselves and not necessarily yeah. the broader genre, right? Like I know there's people that, you know, they just don't like Post Malone for a number of reasons. And it's like, I get it, but you can't put Post Malone in a musical category to be like, oh, I don't like this type of music. Cause I guarantee you whatever other, you know, genre of music you want to put him in there's going to be an artist that sounds like him may not look like him may not have a fan base that you know vibes the way that his does but you're probably going to like something of that of that you know type of thing right yeah yeah absolutely i mean of course how would you even class i've gotten into so many arguments about how to classify a post malone you know is like a lot of some people say he's hip-hop which i don't really i wouldn't classify him as hip-hop um is he pop i guess i guess that's what you'd call it but uh, you know i wouldn't really say that he's rock but but like sad (laughs) yeah pop yeah pop or sad frat party or something you know i mean (laughs) (laughs) uh mood i think mood is a great way with him too yeah i mean is there any other broader implication that you can think of with how moods will just continue to shift over time and how moods may play a bigger role in music, either how it's consumed or how it's monetized. I think really what, what I what's on my mind about that right now is I go back to what you were saying uh, about regionalism and, you know, I wonder if sort of this, this um, movement away from labels of genre and more toward labels of mood has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, there's sort of like, 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 you know, national moods almost um, that you can attach to music in a way that you couldn't when things were sort of regional. And, you know, the, there was that whole moment where radio, uh, you know, the, sort of like the, the consolidation of radio, the kind of switch over to like the clear channel model. And you, you had sort of like the same, you know, whatever it was, Kiss FM or something like that. And you had these big playlists that were just kind of on rotation, the same playlist at this, like all over the country. And it, and you kind of lost a little bit of that local flavor, but, but actually, you know, as people were lamenting that uh, the whole thing shifted over to streaming and there's no regional streaming. Right. And so I think it sort of follows that, that mood would be, be would sort of like become a new means of classification because once you eliminate the regional aspect to it, um, you know, I don't know. It's, it's sort of like maybe a, a necessary movement to happen over time. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's, there's some cons to losing the, the regionalism and, you know, you get some unique sounds and certainly within hip hop, it was really cool to see like Houston versus Bay area, um, you know, like very specific micro climate type, sounds that you could get that that you know would then kind of bubble up and percolate into different um like more mainstream hip-hop sounds um but you know then again i think i think it's cool to have just other genres meld into other genres and have that be kind of the the mixing that happens too so you know pros and cons but 
but but I think I think there are a lot of pros to the to the the mood thing over the the genre label thing. So before long, we're going to have to pour some out for the Dirty South hip hop playlist yeah. that got so much play over time, and maybe this regionalism trend uh, or trend away from regionalism is just the way things are going. This is a sports analogy more so, and there's other reasons behind it, but I look at what's happening in college sports right now with these major teams joining the Big Ten, joining the, you know, or the, or the Big East no longer really being a thing and how so much of that is just a sign of where things are right now and so much of what people really appreciated about what these conferences could tell you about a particular place in the country that's not necessarily going to be the case if you know texas and its whole culture is coming and joining you joining the sec right it's just very different and I think to bring this conversation full circle too, it's like I heard through the through the grapevines about record labels that had wanted to start their own metaverse experiences and being like, okay, this is the record labels metaverse experience. And then someone wisely told them, hey, no one no one cares about your record label. Like that's not the draw here. Like I mean, in the folks that are inside the industry, of course, you can share the accolades and stuff like that, but the fans care about the artists. They're not going to be drawn. Like the days are done of people being like, oh yeah, no, Def Jam, like in the heyday, I'm, I'm there. Like that's just not how it works anymore. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you're really in the business, you, you know, which labels have which ethos, but you know, it, it really has blurred together more and more. And yeah, I think in the old days, you know, people would be like, Oh, I'm an Atlantic Records fan, you know, because when they pulled out that vinyl, that you know, they saw that logo and they knew that there was a certain type of artist and, and that Atlantic Records was was a, a curator of the type of music that they liked, and maybe it wasn't the same genre always, but it was, you know, they knew that it would be good. But you you never even, you know, if you're a casual listener, there's not really even an opportunity to easily know what label anybody is on. So why would you care? And I think especially since uh you know, I mean, I think there was a heyday in the 90s of um, hip hop artists shouting out the record labels that they were on or that they owned. And and that was sort of, you know, important. Um, and, and, every you know, uh, definitely like Rough Riders had a very different ethos from Bad Boy. And, you know, you might classify yourself, you, you know, more in one bucket or another and identify with that. But I think so much of that has just dissipated in the streaming era because, yeah, you're not looking at a physical thing. So, you know, who knows, who cares what labels anybody on and, and, and why the hell would you really want to go to a, an individual label metaverse thing? So I'm glad, I'm glad somebody told them that they shouldn't be. Doing that <laughs> definitely. No, definitely. All right. Well, we saved some time at the end for the session, the section that's near and dear to both of us. As you know, if you followed either my writing or Zach's writing recently, you know that we both had kids very recently. So Zach had his daughter in May, I had mine in June, and it's been great to just, you know, connect and bond and hear more about how things were for both of us leading up to this point and now after. So I figure now that we're on the other side of it with relatively newborn and young children, we could have a little section here called Girl Dad Life, where we each share one interesting or funny experience that's happened for both of us trying to navigate fatherhood here. So Zach, I'll let you start. What's your experience been like and uh, what's yours? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that, um, you know, less than a like a specific story, it's really more about a, an overall vibe mood, if you will, um, that uh, I just, man, I, I know I know it sounds corny, but um, the, the moment you become a parent, this compartment opens up inside of you and it's just filled with a uh, new capacity to love that you, you didn't know was in there. And, and it just is uh, like overwhelming and beautiful and is, is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Um, and I think that one of the things, you, you know, like I think the best advice I would give is, is that there's no like right way to do it. And people have been having babies for a very long time without all the gear and whatever. And we've survived you know, um, as the human race and, um, you know, but, but I think the thing that, that always surprises and delights me is that, um, you know, Riley, despite being eight weeks old, I mean, from the very beginning, 
has been a little human who, who knows what she wants. And it's like pretty straightforward. If she's crying, she, you know, she needs to go to sleep. She needs food or she needs a diaper change. And if she doesn't like that, it's time to put on, um, like any number of different songs or, uh, albums that she likes. I mean, she's a, like, talk about a musical omnivore. Oh my God. She, uh, she loves like Shirley Bassey, big spender. Um, she loves Biggie, Mo Money, Mo Problems. Um, you know, she's really like, uh, uh, no, no, no genre constraints when you're, when you're an infant. And, um, I think it's just really cool to see that, you know, she could be crying and then that beat comes on and she starts smiling, you know, but I would also say like, I, I read this book called bringing along baby and it's all about the French method, uh, of child rearing and, and they're really big into this idea of like the, the baby is a, is like a, a human with thoughts and preferences the, the minute they come out of the womb and, and sort of just like paying attention, you know, um, and, and also giving them a second to try to figure whatever it is out. Like if your baby starts to cry, you know, don't necessarily just like drop everything, rush in and, and, you know, put the binky back in or to start the right, like give your baby a second to try to figure it out. And, 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 and sometimes they won't. Um, and then you go and tend to them. But like, if you don't give them a chance to figure it out as babies, then they'll never be able to sort of figure it out on their own um, as, as adults. So I thought that was a really cool uh, insight. How about yeah. you? Yeah. It's funny. You recommended that book to me. A couple other friends <laughs> did too. And I read it yeah. and yeah, it was, it was a really interesting read and it was a good reminder of like, yeah, people have been doing this for plenty of years. This keep normalize this in lives. And just because your baby doesn't have the newest, fanciest insert, whatever stroller, bassinet, this and that, like, you know, you'll, the fact that you're thinking about this to this extent means that you'll probably be fine and the baby will be fine. But a few, a few funny stories that we, that we have that I could share. So when we were in the labor delivery phase, my wife was delivering the, uh, one of the folks that was in the room with us. She was one of the, uh, she was a volunteer doula that was helping with a few things. She had asked me, she was like, Oh, did you want me to take pictures? Because she could see I was trying to like multitask. My wife wanted me to take some pictures. And I was like, yeah, sure. So then not only did she take pictures, she took a video of everything from like the moment of you know when my wife started pushing to everything after and then i remember like when you know my wife was still recovering i watched it and i was like oh wow i did not realize she captured everything and then my wife was just like i do not want to see that and then i think she heard me watch it and she's like okay i have to see that she was like was that me like that's not, and i was like yes yes that was you but it's okay you know completely normal and expected so that's what's there but yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more on, you know, everything from the love, life-changing perspective, you know, something we had wanted. And, you know, it's been so good from that perspective and just pick it up on cues and stuff. There are definitely a few funny moments that we'll always crack ourselves up as because you have to, right? It's like, I mean, you know, we both know what it's like with the whole sleep deprived and everything and, and all that. But you do start to notice the baby's patterns and stuff and like when, you know, how they'll react to, you know, when you're either about to feed or when you're about to give a bottle or any of those things and just the instant reactions, something else. But no, it's been it's been good. I mean, we're recording today. Today's actually one month since she was born. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. Congrats. Time has flown yeah. by. Time has flown by. And this is like the first podcast I had done since that everything else up to this point had been pre-recorded stuff we planned. So slowly getting back into the swing of things. I think I'll most likely be back in like a full-time perspective maybe sometime later this month but i think you know just going slowly week by week there it feels good to have the work stuff to mix in with everything but uh life changing in the best ways yeah man. what a trainer oh, yeah. friend well so you're coming up on on five weeks and actually one of my favorite moments so far happened at five weeks um my wife and i went out uh with riley in the bat like we have a bassinet attachment on the stroller so we swallow her up and we you know put the thing over the sheet like the the shade over it. And we went out um, for dinner at a sidewalk cafe in New York and, you know, Riley's like sleeping. We're having a great time and chatting and eating. And, um, and, you know, after maybe like an hour, she starts crying. And so I take her out and I'm kind of rocking her and she's crying and, and there are these ladies sitting next to us. And, um, and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. And, and 
they're both like, no, really don't worry. We have, we have babies at home. And my wife goes, Oh, cool. Like how old, um, you know, there's, Oh, it's five, you know, three or four or whatever. And my wife goes, do you have any advice for us? And the one lady goes, how old's your baby? And Danielle says five weeks. And she goes, honey, you don't need any advice. You're out at a restaurant with the five week old. <laughs> like, God bless you. <laughs> so well I, and that was exactly, exactly what we needed to hear. And um, I think it's also like a great indication of, you know, yeah, you, your life isn't, your old life isn't over. You could still do stuff. Um, you just have to plan it a little more carefully and be flexible. And, um, but I, I was shocked. Like if you told me a couple months ago that at, I'd be doing that at five weeks, um, I wouldn't have believed you, but, um, but it's been really cool to just have the summer to chill out and, and spend time with Riley. And, uh, it's so, it's so cool to be having like the same, <laughs> almost exactly the same timing as you would kind of like go through the, go through the milestones. So, so oh, yeah. It, it, yeah, definitely. Um, when do you think you'll bring Riley to a music festival or some type of event like that where she's wearing the headphones and you and Danielle are enjoying yourselves? We we already got her headphones. Uh, and Earmuffs, I should say. On. I say headphones yeah, like yeah, she's yeah, going yeah, 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 exactly. to listen yeah, to right, right, right. Yeah. Earmuffs. Well, we, we put them on. We, tr- we did a trial run on 4th, 4th of July. Uh, and initially – she she smiled a lot and I think she thought they were pretty cool and then she was like get this shit off of me so I don't know um I think we we actually were thinking of venturing into Central Park to summer stage um a couple weeks ago I think trombone shorty was there and then our plan just got blown up with like the various uh feeding schedules and things like that so I don't know. I think we're ready to try. I think it just has to be a summer stage thing and it has to be like not too hot or too cold and, and we'll, we'll go and and go for it. Um, But I think the first time we're just not going to buy tickets. We're just going to stand outside and see how it goes, you know, for like a half an hour. And then if that's okay, then maybe we'll, we'll work our way up. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, so great to be in a, in a place where live music is just, you know, a short walk away. Um, and and uh, it would be a lot trickier if we could, she hates being in the car. So it's a good thing we're in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. No, that's great. What, yeah. When's your first concert plan? Uh, it's funny because last year outside lands here in San Francisco was in October. So in my mind, I was like, Oh yeah, we could do it in October. But then I forgot that it was a pandemic year and outside lands is normally in August. So mm. that's like two weeks from now. It's like first weekend in August that outside lands is. And I'm it's like, we're aggressive. definitely at, you know, the cafe yeah. outdoor like stage going to like friends' houses and stuff like that. Yeah. A concert might be a little much in, you know, two weeks if you're listening to this one week from recording. But I'm hoping that, you know, some early fall, hopefully we can we could do something. Yeah. Well, fingers yeah. fingers crossed for both of us. Definitely. Definitely. Well, Zach, this is a pleasure. Appreciate you coming on. We'll make sure that we link to Tiffany's post in the show notes. And yeah, till next time, um, hit you up and then, you know, we could definitely save some stuff for our next Girl Dad Life Quarter. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of stuff happening in the industry. Everyone's on vacation right now, relaxing, but soon enough, things will be ramping back up. Amen. Well, thanks for having me on, Dan, as always. And uh, best of luck, uh, fatherhood on your end, too. Likewise. Thanks, man. All right.